Ah, the Christmas season is upon us. And with that comes the opportunity to invite your friends and family to High Desert Church for Christmas Eve services. It's easier than you think. Step one, think of someone. Step two, hand them tickets, preferably to the service you're attending. Or if you're digitally inclined, visit hdc.mobi forward slash invite to find an invite kit for you to share with your social media friends. Step three, say, would you like to join me for Christmas Eve service at High Desert Church? Step four, smile and look friendly. That's all there is to it. No better time to start changing your world than today. Hello, HDC. It is great being with you here this weekend. Uh, this is our Campus Leads Weekend, and so across the valley, Hesperia, Apple Valley, and Phelan all have their Leads teaching. Normally, that would be Pastor Todd here today, but with the gift fair going on and all those responsibilities he had, he asked me to fill in for him, and so uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this weekend. If you have uh, not received a note pack yet, raise your hand. We'll get the notes towards you. Just uh, lift your hands up. We'll find you. And if you're a Bible-carrying person or a phone with the Bible on it-carrying person, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 a little bit later in the morning. Let me encourage you with some good news. Christmas is 18 days away. Yes, I heard what I thought I was going to hear. There was the moan and the groan, oh, obviously from a parent who hasn't shopped yet. And the kids, we have extra students and children in the room, they're thrilled because it's getting closer. And, and if we looked across the spans of the room, I and mean, from the, the youngest kids to the oldest folks, um, we all kind of share at least one thing probably in common, and that is when you were a child, and you have to think way back for some of you, but think back when you were a child, and if you are a child, you know this is true, there's that agonizing wait for Christmas to finally show up, right? I mean, it, it's just terrible because you keep waiting and waiting, and, and basically from Thanksgiving to Christmas, it seems like an eternity. Because you know it's supposed to get here, but you wait and wait. Now, myself, it actually was doubly bad because my birthday is the day before Christmas. Yeah, thank you. Bring it on. Give me some sympathy. <laughs> Counseling is kicking in. It's doing fine. I'm getting much better. But for me, I was like, I, and I know it's a selfish money grab thing, but I was looking double gifts. So I'm just thinking, this is sweet, but it took forever. And now in our culture, I think it's actually gotten worse because... I just, like for me, I turn on my radio and, and the Christmas music seems to start in July. Like, dude, it's, we're months away from this thing. And, and then I know even our own ham, uh, home, we like to torture our children. And so we th use a thing called an advent calendar. You ever use an advent calendar? Those are great ways to torture your children who are waiting for Christmas. Because it's this slow, you open up one little box a day and there's this picture of a Christmas scene and it just drags on and on and on. And and no one has the patience anyway. I know I'm always cheating and pulling extra things and trying to glue them shut so my wife doesn't catch me. But I can always blame it on the children, which is always a win. <laughs> but that's the way Christmas is. It's agonizing. But when you think again, back to being a child, the best part of Christmas was knowing that it would actually come someday. It may take a long time to get there. It may seem like it dragged heavily through the month of December. But eventually it would show up. And you'd realize the joy that came from that event. And that same dynamic of waiting is what made the first Christmas so extraordinary. You had men and you had women and you had children. And they had been waiting, not for days, but they had been waiting for hundreds of years for Jesus Christ to show up. For the first Christmas to even happen. And they were waiting for that and it was agonizing. And some of the people as they waited actually lost heart. They got distracted and discouraged and they got weary of waiting and so they turned their attention to other issues and other matters. But there was always a remnant, a group of people who watched and waited in hope that Jesus Christ would someday come to this place. And over the next three weekends, we're gonna look at some of those remnant people, the people who waited with hope for the coming of Christ. And we're gonna see that in the prophets we're going to see that in Mary, and we're going to see that in the shepherds. And we're going to watch their lives, and when we kind of dig in, we're going to see some characteristics, some qualities that need to be true of us as they were in them. One is that we need to be bold. We need to be bold in our relationship to our world and as we walk with God. We also need to be willing, willing to do what God says. And we need to be quick about it. 
to say, God, when you tell me to do something, I'm not going to wait or delay, I'm going to go. And you see, as those three factors you see on the screen, they're joined together, in that moment it becomes an action of a faithful person. Those qualities converge into the story of Christmas, and we'll see that just as those people were faithful, we can be that as well. And so today we're going to talk about the prophets and what it means to be a prophet. And if you've ever thought of that word prophecy or being a prophet, one of the first things that probably comes to your mind is that of someone who tells the future about something yet to come. Someone who's able to predict what is going to happen. And to be fair, God's prophets at times did that. In fact, they were part of that remnant few that were looking to the coming of Christ, and some of those prophets actually predicted that Jesus Christ would come in the way he came hundreds of years before it happened. Uh, the prophet Isaiah, he predicted that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, would be born of a virgin. He said this in Isaiah chapter 7, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign... The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, or God with us. Another prophet named Jeremiah predicted that there would be suffering surrounding the birth of Christ. And he wasn't talking about the terrible and great pain of actually giving birth. He was talking about the surrounding experiences of that birth. Because if you know what happened when Jesus Christ came into the earth, Herod killed all these children are bound Bethlehem in hopes of killing Jesus Christ. Look what Jeremiah said hundreds of years before Christ's birth. This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Rachel, that symbol of the people of God that were struggling with the loss of babies and life. Micah, another prophet, foretold that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, the actual city he would be born in. Here's what he said. But you, Bethlehem of Pephrathah, you, though you are small among the clans of Judah, a small town, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times." And so when we think of prophet, we think of that person who is future-based, these prophecies that declare, and in this case, the coming of Jesus Christ, and they brought hope to this remnant, hope to the people that were hanging on to think another Advent door is opening, maybe now is the day it's going to happen. That was part of their job. But you might be thinking here, Kurt, that's great. I, that's, I'm sure that's what a prophet did, but that's not me. How am I supposed to relate and, and relate to this person of a prophet? Because I don't tell the future. I really can't tell you what's going to happen tomorrow. I, I can't even figure out really what's going on in life at the time. Well, how does this even relate? Well, the main job of a, of a prophet was to be a proclaimer like you see on the screen. That was the number one job that they had. Not to tell the future, but to tell the truth as God has given it to them. And you see, historically, as a prophet would come into this role, he had three things that were required. One, he had to be called as a mouthpiece by God. He had to be called as a mouthpiece. This was not a self-appointed position. He didn't wake up one day and say, today I'm going to be a prophet. Uh, I feel pretty confident in this. And go out there. No, he had to be called by God to say what God wanted him to say. He really served as a proxy, someone who stood in for God face to face talking to people. The second requirement of a prophet is they had to be given a message. They had to be given a message. They didn't just wing it, they didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to start telling you these great wise things. The message had to be clear, it had to be concise, and they had to know that it was absolutely from God. And this is important because this wasn't like every time a prophet spoke, it was authoritatively. You know, they didn't wake up in the morning and, and come into the kitchen and breakfast and, and say to their wife, Maketh me thou my breakfast, woman, and I want hash browns and eggs and toast and push me some drink toward my body. That didn't even sound right. And by the way, historically speaking, they didn't speak King James in the Old Testament. That's okay. But they didn't speak. You only spoke authoritatively as a prophet when God gave you something to say. 
So they would live a relatively normal life in one regard, but when God gave them a message, they were to speak that message in exactly and only what that was. But it would never be possible unless they would be emboldened to speak, which is that last note there in your blank. You see, you could have been called to be God's mouthpiece. You could actually be given a message from God, but you needed courage to say those words. Sometimes prophets didn't like the message that God wanted them to tell people. And lacking in boldness to follow God, they actually ran the opposite direction and refused to say it. If you remember Jonah. Remember God said, I want you to go to Nineveh and tell those Assyrians that I've got hope for them. And he says, I don't want to tell them that. And he got in a ship the opposite direction going to Tarshish because he didn't want to do his job. Busy, he lacked the boldness to pull it off. If you remember the prophet Elijah, he had just defeated the, the prophets of Baal and he had destroyed them. And then this woman Jezebel says, I am going to kill you. He was faithful to tell his story that God had given to him, the message, but even after the fact, he ran in terror because this woman was after him. You see, in the end, whether it's through a fish or whether it's God restoring a prophet in the wilderness, boldness will come into our lives if we seek it out. That is what set a prophet aside because they became the voice of their generation. And I hope, as you look at these three criteria on the screen and in your notes, you begin to notice that this is you. This isn't the prophet only from the Bible. This is you. You have been called to be God's mouthpiece. You have been given a message. You have been emboldened or can be emboldened to speak on his behalf to your generation, to your eight to 15. And so God's call is to speak prophetically, declaring what it is he wants you to say. So I guess the question is today, will you share the message God has given to you? Do you even know what that message is? You see, I think the challenge most of us face is the boldness to say what we know God wants us to say. God, I don't have the boldness. I know kind of maybe what I'm supposed to say, but even that I'm not totally sure about. And so we say nothing. I want to take you to a quick story in the Bible from a guy who wasn't a prophet. And we'll learn from him a little bit of what it is you should be saying and how to find boldness to do that. Luke chapter 1. Before I start reading in verse 5, just give you the backdrop here. This story we're going to read is happening six months prior to Mary getting a visit from the angel telling her she's going to give birth to the Son of God, the Messiah. Okay, so we're six months prior to that event in the time of Herod. Verse 5, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. So here we have a family. He's from a priestly line. His wife comes from a priestly line, which basically just means they both came from spiritual legacies. They had this, this walk of history with their family where this is part of who they were. And then it says both of them, verse six, were righteous in the sight of God. Not just in the sight of others, but righteous in God's perspective because of all the law, they, excuse me, because they observed all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. So here we have two righteous people, two remnant people, people who have been looking for the promise of God, but they can't have children. It's kind of the backdrop to the story. As a priest, Zechariah would be asked to serve in the temple. And so in the rest of the story, a little bit ago, we go through here. He goes down to Jerusalem to make his service. He goes twice, two weeks a year. He comes to the temple. He draws lots. They take his name out of a package and say, hey, Zechariah, it's time for you to serve in the temple today. 
He gets himself prepared. He has his two assistants that he would walk into the temple with. He walks in with them. They prepare themselves and purify themselves for the ministry they're going to do on behalf of the people. The two servants or the the assistants will leave, walk out. He now goes into the center to go to the altar where he is going to offer incense and burn this as a gift to God on behalf of the people that he represents outside. There's a huge crowd of people waiting because this was a huge deal. Zechariah goes in and he stands by the altar. In verse 11, things change. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. By the way, every time you see an angel, if you ever see one, you'll be terrified. In the Bible, that's just everyone's response. It wasn't like, ooh, cool, touched by an angel or something, you know. No, this was terrifying. Every time someone sees an angel, lots of times they drop down on their face if they were a dead person. So, I mean, it's not fun to see an angel. It's overwhelming. But then the angel does what the angel does, and every time an angel meets someone, usually they give the angel response, which is the next passage. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your, your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you were to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. Verse 16, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. He'll bring back those people who stopped looking. He'll pull them back in and pull them into that remnant of faithful folks. And he will go on, verse 17, before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the, wi- to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Gave, the angel says, hey, here's the story. I have this message for you. Your, your wife, the one that hasn't been able to have a child, is going to have a baby. Now, this is pretty overwhelming, and he's getting this information at a tough time, but look at his response in the next verse in 18. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man, and my wife is well along in years. He hears this message, and I love his response in two different ways. One is, guys, if you're ever considering to talk about the age of your wife, this is the answer to have. I am old. My wife is not exactly young. I think maybe he knew this was going to be held against him later or something as God wrote this into Scripture. He's like, let's make sure we're clear about this. Never said she was old. And then the next part is the most important part, obviously. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. (laughs) I stand in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you. I I just think sometimes there's humor you don't see in the Bible. It's like, Dude, I'm Gabriel. Do you know who I am? Remember when Daniel got a, got a visit from an angel? That was me. I was the one who showed up and gave him that information. He shows up at the temple. He says, I'm Gabriel. How can you not believe I stand in the presence of God? I'm bringing you a message, but because you don't have the faith to believe, text goes on to tell us, I'm going to shut your mouth for for nine months until that baby is actually born because you did not have the faith, you did not have the boldness to act on what I told you was going to happen. And the rest of the story plays out just like this. He walks out of the temple. He was in there way too long, so the crowds were really worried. Dude, something happened to Zechariah. He's in there way too long. He finally walks out. He cannot speak. They realize he's seen something, and it says he goes home. Not long after, his wife becomes pregnant, The time is accomplished that she's going to give birth. And she gives birth to a boy. And all the family and friends are coming around, and it's time to name the child. And everyone knows if you name your child, if you only have one son, you name him after who? Pops. This is Zechariah Jr. popping out here. This is the kid. That's a promise. And they say, what's his name? And Elizabeth says, his name's to be John. And they're like, no way. It's not his name. Okay, sure, your husband can't talk, but we're going to go talk to him. And so they go around. They said, hey, Zechariah, your wife is like a rocker. She's trying to name this kid something. It's not your name. What do you want to name him? Zechariah gets out the paper and says, his name is John. Shows it to them. And in that very moment, 
His mouth was open so that he could speak. What do you say when you've been shut up for nine months? Imagine this, that if today God shut your mouth, the next time you were able to speak a word was September 2015. What would be the first words out of your mouth? Zechariah shows us how we should respond as well. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. His father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Now he's declaring these things. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us. The very first words out of his mouth were praise to God. God, I can speak. No, no, that's not what he's talking about, is it? God, you have come and you are gonna provide something amazing. And in this passage, he goes on to talk about Jesus. He knows what's coming. He says, Jesus, you are coming and you are gonna be amazing. And he declares the greatness of God. And that is the first thing you and I have to do when we boldly declare who he is. It's starting with God. And God, you are amazing. But then Zechariah goes on into his declaration and he begins to share with us the same thing that our world needs to hear as well. Because we have to be bold to tell our world at least three things. The first is that we need to reveal salvation to them. In verse 76, he says, you, my child, referring now to John, this is now becoming John the Baptist. So if you're worried, kind of thinking who the John is, this is becoming John the Baptist. You, John the Baptist, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. And what are you going to do, John? You are going to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins. Folks, we need to be bold in telling our family and friends about what salvation really is. Because we live in a world, much like the world of, 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 the, of the first century, that didn't get salvation. Because we all typically define it the same way. Salvation really, in most people's perspective, is God, would you please save me from something that is external to me? Would you take care of that out there because I need to get saved from that? To the Jewish audience, John was gonna speak, it was save me from paganism that's surrounding us. Save me from Roman oppression and occupation. Save me from those things in my life that are challenging my happiness and my sanity. And we go to our life and we have the tendency to say the same things just in different packaging. God, save me from my wife. You can lie, I guess I should, should finish it quicker than that. Save me from my wife who's, who's just beating me down. Save me from my job. There's no point in it. God, I just need a job. God, God, save me from my, my lack of money. Would you please give me more money? God, save me from this, from this, from this. And our world needs to hear from people like you and I that the problem is save me from this, from this, from this. If the problem is only gonna be viewed from the outside, we'll never find change for our people that we love so much. But our world oftentimes just can't see it. It's just out of their sight and they can't get a grip on it. And that's why we come into that world and we speak. Currently, I'm teaching my teenage daughter how to drive our car. Yeah, I know. I was going to ask you all to come and lay hands on me and pray that I'll be safe. <laughs> Even this morning, I was taking a ride, and so I got my helmet on like normal, and uh, <laughs> just got ready for the drive. Your insurance policy's paid up. It's good. And so I go out with her, and no, she's doing great. But as I'm teaching her how to drive, one of the funniest things I'm watching is it's really hard to teach her about blind spots. Because she's kind of sh shorter, height challenge, okay, that's a better term. And so she's driving, and I said, babe, check your blind spot, because there could be someone there. And she's like, she, you know, she looks into the seat, kind of, look around this way, and she's dead, I can't see anything about it. And I said, well, that's, that's the problem with the blind spot. By definition, it's a blind spot. You don't see anything there. But trust me, honey, when you drive, be real careful, because there could be something very dangerous in that spot that you need to be aware of. You don't want to hit that thing. 
And she doesn't get it yet because it's not a reality, but I know as I keep talking to her about it, it's beginning to draw attention in her mind that that's something that's a reality. She may not see it, but it's there. And I want to let you know, you have 8 to 15 people in your life who have a spiritual blind spot. They know there's a problem. They know there's probably something dangerous there, but they can't put their finger on it. And as you talk to your family and friends, to be bold enough to say, hey, I know things are going bad for you right now. I know you're in a tough spot, but I want to let you know what you need most is salvation. You need to have a relationship with God, and, and you can't see it right now, but it's there. And, and would you be asking God to open your heart up to see maybe what is missing in your life? Our job is to be bold at that, to offer that, to say there is forgiveness for you. The second requirement is to reveal God's tender mercy. Luke 178 says, because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven. The picture here is that kind of that blind spot, but the, the other term now is the other image is kind of a darkness. There's this darkness, and, and Jesus is saying, hey, when, when, when Jesus comes, there's this light that's gonna permeate everything, and it's this light of a tender mercy God. Pastor Tom has explained this, splagna, this term means bowels. It's, it's an emotive term. It's God not just being merciful, but it is driven by emotion with his mercy. He reaches out and longs for people to come to know him and to get out of the darkness. Because when you live in darkness, no matter what you are in your life, spiritual darkness, three things you're dealing with. Either fear, hopelessness, or in that last element, just danger, because you don't see things. You see, under fear, you're terrified about your future. Under hopelessness, you don't think you have a future. And under danger, you don't realize how precarious your future really is. And in darkness, you need to have light, and, and God is saying, I am gonna come as the light as a tenderful, merciful God. And this is huge for your family and friends and as it is for mine. Because lots of them, if they look in the mirror, they really are not sure there's a lot of hope. If I was to give you some names and I give you some single names, you could, I don't wanna say it out loud, but just think in your mind what pops up. Charles Manson. Ray Rice, Miley Cyrus, Monica Lewinsky. You see, those names come into your mind, some of them from older generations, some from more modern, but typically as we hear names, we try to just, we, we, we put labels on them. We stick a label on people. Sometimes they stick it on themselves. And then they live with that. And they have a label on their life, and that label says something. And I'll let you know, people in your world, in your relational world, in your oikos, they have labels. Maybe you've stuck one on them. Maybe they've stuck it on themselves. But it says alcoholic. The label says adulterer. The label says workaholic. The label could say anything about them, but they view that label so powerfully that maybe God can't help me because the God that they have heard about is the God of wrath and condemnation. But they've never also heard about the God who treats his people with loving compassion. The tender mercy kind of God. And so what you can do boldly is to go into your world and say, folks, you have a badge, you have a label that you're wearing. But that label is, doesn't have to stay on you. God will redefine you and he'll take that label and he'll initially write this, my child who is lost. And they begin to understand that and they begin to look at that as you talk to them day after day and say, I'm, I'm God's child but I'm lost. I, I don't belong there yet. And then God will say, through your words, there's hope. There is hope. And he takes the badge, the label. And he writes on it, my child. Puts it on your friend or family member. And then they'll be able to walk in the path of peace. Because to those he will shine a light living in the darkness. 
and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. Peace is one of those things in life we kind of sing about it the Christmas season. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men, and we sing the song, and we kind of think what it means. In this context, it is, I am now right with God. My label has been changed. I can be proud of whose I am. But it also is the confident, settled calmness that I'm ready to walk with him, that I'm ready to live for God in his tender mercy. And I want to let you know today, you have a world who needs you to be bold and to speak up for God, to be his mouthpiece in your generation because you've been given the message. And the only thing that is stopping you from inviting your friends to Christmas Eve service, the only thing that's stopping you from having a conversation about something that really matters in life is your willingness to be bold and act on it. And I'm not saying that's easy, but when you begin to ask God for boldness, he will give it to you. And he will give you the confidence to speak on his behalf because now you know you're not going out there with your own message. You don't have anything good to say. I get it, I don't either. But when I'm bringing out the message of Jesus Christ is revealed in his word, I am bringing the best story possible to their lives. They need to hear it, but they won't unless you're bold. So will you speak prophetically to your world today? Will you speak in such a powerful way that they stop and want to look in the mirror and say, maybe there is a problem in my blind spot. Maybe the label that I've been wearing, I'm ready to get rid of that. Maybe I'm ready for a new path that leads to peace and not all the angst and attitude and anger that I deal with on a regular basis. You see, your boldness will cause them to take a second look at who they are. And it's in those moments that God reaches in and touches them and makes them his own. Let's pray. If you are here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to make that decision today. Because in the words of Zechariah, as he made this prophecy about what his son would say and do, it is the same things that we declare every weekend here at HDC. To have a relationship with God, first you need to have salvation and the forgiveness of your sins, which means you need to admit that you have sins, that you have fallen short of God's perfect standards. And we all have, that's, that's not that hard to admit. But maybe you need to do that today. We talk about believing and we believe in the tender mercy of God who provided Jesus Christ to die on the cross, to take those consequences for your sin and to take mine. Do you believe that? And if you do, then it's a choice to choose to walk into the path of peace, to say, God, I am gonna walk with you. And even though things are swirling around me and it's out of control, with you in my life, God, there will be peace that gives me understanding and hope and joy for my day-to-day -day existence. Those things you could pray right now silently in your own heart. And if you do that, if you pray those things to God, he says, he will rip off the label that you placed on yourself and he will slap a new one on there. That you are a new creation, that the old has gone and the new has come because you're now a child of God. Lord God, for those of us who came into this room knowing you already, we readily admit we need boldness. We need to have that spirit of Elijah and John and the prophets who declared your truth. God, we need that boldness because we now have a message. We know what it is. 
We recognize we are calling out to our generation, but please, God, would you empower us by your Holy Spirit to speak into the lives of people who need to have this message given to them for the sake of their souls. Lord God, this week, may we be the men and women and children of the remnant family who look forward, not just to the past of your coming at Christmas, but look forward to the arrival of your son, Jesus Christ. And until you come back for us, God, may we be faithful to point everyone to Jesus Christ, our Messiah, the Christ of Christmas, and it's his name we pray, amen. Before you go, a couple things. Go to the gymnasium for the Global Gift Fair to buy something. You can use that as a great conversation starter with your family and friends and also your tickets for Christmas Eve. Please don't trample each other. Thanks.